chair, but you know, Shuki's gone. So I am going to have to step in and introduce uh, 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 Peter Bergen, who you've probably all seen on television. Um, <clears throat> is really one, as I indicated in the notice, is uh, uh, one of the leading journalists in, uh, in the country and has been at the, uh, um, at the forefront of covering both bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and all the developments in terrorism for, for the last 10, 15 years. And, and I say 50, really going back to the mid-90s. So he's been there well before 9-11 um, <clears throat> uh, well uh, uh, and it was 97? Yeah, yeah. 97, uh, uh, we described it in the book, but 97 and this uh, uh, interview was the only American journalist to, to interview bin Laden uh, in an amazing um, uh, story that he describes. Um, and he has uh, written a number of things. His the book that he's going to talk about today is uh, Manhunt, uh, the search for Bin Laden. And uh, we, as usual, have it for sale up there, uh, and so everybody can buy a copy. And then, in the reception, you can uh, get him to get him to sign it. I always like to say, authors, I'm sh uh, it's one of the great narcissistic pleasures of writing a book <laughs> to be able to sign copies that people buy. Thank you very much, Professor Schroeder, and thanks for the uh, invitation, and thanks for coming today. And, uh, you know, Kindle doesn't allow you to sign That's books, correct. unfortunately. Uh, but eventually they'll come up with a feature that, that will let you do that. So, you know, this book, Manhunt, was the fourth book that I wrote about Al-Qaeda, and <clears throat> I've been, uh, as, as Chuck indicated, um, been writing or thinking about bin Laden and Al-Qaeda for a long time before I wrote the book, and so I was able, I think, to distill quite a lot of um, thinking into one relatively short volume, which I began writing um, the day after bin Laden <coughs> was killed. And uh, I had a pretty tight deadline, uh, which is actually a good thing, because I tend to blow deadlines, and uh, I think deadlines are uh, useful. Um, they brought a certain energy to the writing of the book. Uh, because I had about 10 months to report and write and research and uh, edit. Um, and so this is the first book I've ever sat down in a very self-conscious way, instead of just sort of writing and writing and writing and hoping that it will come out uh, at the end okay. <clears throat> Can't we sort of have, have a much better, I had a much better plan going in to write this book. And the plan basically, I, I thought I needed to answer five or six big questions which were, one, um, what was bin Laden doing after 9-11, and as a subset of that, to what extent was he controlling al-Qaeda, and as a subset of that, how was al-Qaeda doing in general? Two, um, what was the, the CIA story of finding bin Laden, which is really an Agatha Christie story of how they did that? Interestingly, uh, and appropriately for an Agatha Christie story, uh, many of the people involved in that in that hunt were women uh, at the agency. Uh, third, the sort of evolution of Joint Special Operations Command, which did the operation and which is a very different animal today than it would have been um, in the 90s. And one of the reasons that President Obama uh, basically was pretty comfortable with authorizing the mission was he had very little, he had very little reason to worry that the mission would fail militarily. There were a lot of other things he had to worry about uh, politically about the mission, but uh, militarily uh, as, an, as an operation that could be pulled off by this group of men, uh, he did not uh, have to worry himself too much. And as you know, there were still problems with the mission. Um, and another uh, sort of thing I had to deal with to some degree was the US-Pakistan relationship, which was uh, at an all-time low during this uh, uh, operation. And, um, and then, of course, I had to deal with the decision-making process uh, in the White House and President Obama as a decision-maker, and also President Obama, parenthetically, as a commander-in-chief. And this is a lot clearer now than it would have been when I started writing, I think. But you know, this is one of the most aggressive, uh, militarily aggressive presidents uh, of the post-World War II era, which I think um, it was pretty surprising for a lot of people who voted for him uh, in 2000 uh, and, and eight, uh, because he's not the president I think that they thought that they were voting for. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I did in the book was to go back and look at some of his key speeches 
uh, before he was elected president and shortly after he was elected president as a clue to trying to understand him as a commander in chief. And um, he was very explicit about um, his views about the use of force in two uh, key speeches that I went back to for the book. One was a speech he gave on August the 1st, uh, 2007, I believe was the date, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in, um, in Washington, D.C. And this was his big keynote foreign policy speech because, of course, the presumptive Democratic candidate was Hillary Clinton, who was regarded as having uh, foreign policy credentials by virtue of the fact that she was first lady for eight years. She was also on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And the presumptive uh, Republican candidate was John McCain, who, of course, had been on the Senate Armed Services Committee for 30 years and was also seen as somebody with real national security credentials. And uh, the speech which he gave at Woodrow Wilson was written uh, with Lee Hamilton, who ran the Woodrow Wilson Center at that time, who had been the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee for many years. Uh, ben Rhodes, who would then go on to become the deputy national security advisor for strategic communications. Susan Rice, who of course is the national security advisor now. And Dennis McDonough, who's now the chief of staff. <clears throat> and they basically, um, they knew that this speech was a key speech to explain uh, who President Obama was, or potentially President Obama was on foreign policy. Um, and they labored over one particular line in the speech at some length, and that was a line which essentially said that in, if, if, we, if it was clear that the Pakistanis uh, uh, were not going to go after some high-value target in Pakistan and that the United States knew about the presence of this person, that uh, the United States would reserve the right to go into Pakistan unilaterally to capture or kill this target. Um, and this, you may recall, produced a chorus of condemnation from all sides, from both the Democrats and the Republicans, when this particular part of the speech was reported. Um, Governor Mitt Romney, who was a Republican candidate for president at the time, uh, described Pre uh, Barack Obama as a Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Christopher Dodd, who was also a candidate for president, uh, said something equally disparaging. Hillary Clinton was, said something disparaging. John McCain said something disparaging about, you know, this is a guy who's going to attack our allies, etc. But from the very beginning, uh, Barack Obama said that he was willing to take unilateral action against al-Qaeda in a country that was normally an ally of the United States. Fast forward a, f a couple of years, and I looked at President Obama's uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in Oslo. Uh, very early on in his presidency, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And he must have been the first person in history to go and accept the Nobel Peace Prize and outline his philosophy of war uh, during his acceptance speech. And basically, he, he said, you know, much as I admire him, I think it's one of the best speeches. I'm sure he wrote it uh, largely himself. It's, it's a very well-written speech, and I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing it rather than quoting from it. He said, much as I admire Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, um, nonviolence wouldn't have stop, stopped the Nazis, and nonviolence is uh, unlikely to stop Al Qaeda, and it's not a group you can negotiate with. And, and essentially, it was a sort of uh, an outline of his theory of just wars. Um, and so, when you took, take these two speeches together, uh, in a sense, the decision that he ultimately made, and in fact, his whole drone campaign, is a lot less surprising than people might have uh, considered it initially. Uh, it's, um, and I, I, I don't have a really good answer for why he uh, is very comfortable with the use of American power, uh, but I will make the observation that he's the first major American political figure <clears throat> for a very long time who what he did or did not do in Vietnam is not part of his story. So, uh, you know, unlike Dick Cheney, you took five, five deferments, or uh, George W. Bush, who was in the Texas National Guard, or John McCain, who, of course, spent five years in prison in Vietnam, or Bill Clinton, who basically got, uh, you know, was, was at the University of Oxford uh, for, during, during the time he might have served in Vietnam, or, or John Kerry, who, of course, did serve in Vietnam. It's, be, it's that the Vietnam experience has been a huge part of all these political stories. And it's just, not, it's just completely absent in Barack Obama's story because he was too young to either serve or not serve. Um, and in a way, he's not haunted by, by that, that, you know, the experience of Vietnam. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't know if that's a good answer to why he's very comfortable with use of American power, uh, but I think it may be an answer. So President Obama as a decision maker uh, was some, certainly something I needed to deal with in the book. 
um, and I'll get into the actual decisions in a, in, a, in a little bit. But before we get there, let me first of all paint a picture of what Osama bin Laden was doing after 9-11, and we have pretty good detail on that, and then uh, explain the Agatha Christie story about how he was found, um, and a little bit of the, uh, the military story behind the Joint Special Operations Command. So after 9-11, as you know, uh, Osama bin Laden fled uh, ultimately to the to Tora Bora in eastern Afghanistan, which is an area which is uh, mountains that rise to 14,000 feet and is a, a very good place to disappear. Um, there are multiple exit routes into Pakistan. Uh, there was a battle there <coughs> basically from about December 3rd to December 14th, 2001. And you may recall in the 2004 campaign, John Kerry made a big issue of the fact that the Bush administration uh, essentially let bin Laden go at the Battle of Tara Bora, not, wit not wittingly, but de facto. And um, Tommy Franks, who was in charge of the operation there, uh, he was the head of CENTCOM, actually wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying that Kerry was wrong, that the, uh, that the intelligence that bin Laden was at Tara Bora was sketchy and he could have been a lot of other places. That was all total nonsense, by the way. Um, during the battle, there were multiple... Uh, multiple interceptions of bin Laden's voice on the radio by people on the ground who recognized his voice, who'd been tracking him. Um, there, were, there was a request from the CIA officers on the ground for a battalion of rangers to be put in, 800 men. Uh, that re request was turned down by Tommy Franks, and I was able actually to have an email exchange with him about what, what his reasoning was, why he turned down that request. And, he had, and it's in the book, uh, basically he had a whole laundry list of regions, reasons, including we didn't know if bin Laden was there, uh, we didn't want to repeat the mistakes of the Soviets. It would have taken a long time. And all of, all of these, by the way, are, are, I think are, are false in one way or another. Um, you could have, I've actually talked to General, General Stanley McChrystal about this issue uh, after the book came out, who was at the time the head of the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg. Uh, he said, look, we could have put a battalion of rangers in there within a week. Now, would bin Laden have been caught? I don't know. Um, you know, it was, <clears throat> it was in the middle of winter. This is a very difficult terrain. Uh, but the, I, one factoid speaks for itself. There were more journalists at the Battle of Tora Bora than American soldiers. So, um, <laughs> you know, I can say that with a great deal of precision because uh, there were about 70 U.S. Special Forces at the battle uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a handful of CIA officers, a dozen British Special Boat Service officers, um, and there were at least 100 journalists at the height of the battle. So if Fox and CNN and the Washington Post and every other news organization could manage to get their teams there, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly raises a question about why the United States couldn't get a uh, greater force there. So anyway, um, bin Laden disappeared from the Battle of Tara Bora, and we now know that he did something very clever, which is instead of going into Pakistan, which is where you expect him to go, he doubled back into eastern Afghanistan to an area called Kunar, which is very mountainous and heavily wooded, and he spent a few months there. Then he moved to Peshawar in Pakistan, uh, which is a city of several million people on the border in 2002. And I can say all this with a great deal of certainty because uh, after the paperback edition of my book came out, no, in fact, for this, before this edition came out, um, a uh, Islamabad police report summarizing the interrogation of one of his wives uh, became public. Um, and that really reconstructs exactly what bin Laden was doing for the, for the nine years he was in Pakistan. So he lived in Peshawar for two th in 2002. Um, he then moved north into Swat, uh, which is where the Pakistani Taliban um, you know, staged quite a renaissance in 2009. Uh, he was in a number of cities around, that, around the Swat region, um, and eventually he got to Abtabad, uh, which is... <coughs> in central northern Pakistan, and he arrived there in the summer of 2005. Um, during that period, bin Laden had four kids. Um, most fugitives don't have multiple children when they're on the run, uh, certainly not the world's most wanted man. He, had, uh, he was with his wives, two of them. His third wife joined in 2010. Uh, the wives are kind of unexpected. One, is a, one was a 63-year-old 63, 63 uh, Saudi PhD, uh, PhD in Quranic theology. Uh, the second was a 53-year-old, with, again with a PhD, a Saudi. Uh, these were highly educated women. They basically married bin Laden, knowing that in their own minds he was a jihadi war hero. And the, f and the youngest wife was a Yemeni who didn't graduate from high school. Uh, she's the one that he had the four kids with while he was on the run. Um, and these were, these, these, these were with him. So uh, when he was on the run, 
Uh, he had most, uh, for a good chunk of the time, he had a dozen kids and grandkids with him and, th and three wives. Um, he arrives in Abtabad, and uh, he lives there, and I was the only outside observer to, be, uh, to get into the compound before it was uh, demolished by the Pakistanis. Uh, and I, I didn't know it was going to be demolished uh, two weeks after I visited, but um, it did allow me to get a pretty good sense of, um, of um, how bin Laden was living. And he was not living, uh, you know, it, was, it was a pretty rudimentary uh, life. They were, um, it w the, the, the compound probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to build. Uh, it was, certainly wasn't a million dollar mansion as it was initially portrayed. Um, they were growing their own crops. They were self-sufficient. Uh, they had their own cows, cattle, chickens, honeybees, uh, vegetables. Um, they didn't really have to go uh, out much, uh, which of course was good for security. Um, there were three families living on the compound, the two bodyguards who were also the couriers and their wives and kids, and bin Laden's uh, wives and kids. The compound extended over about an acre. Um, there was very little, there was no air conditioning for a place that got hot in the summer. Uh, very little heating. I looked at, I was able to examine the um, gas and electricity bills. They were spending, you know, 25 bucks a month on, on gas and electricity. Uh, they were sleeping on uh, beds that were like almost made of this kind of material that was very, or actually much worse. It was basically sort of like bits of uh, wood sort of hammered together. Um, and so it was a, you know, uh, it was a Spartan existence. On the other hand, for the world's most wanted man, uh, it wasn't a bad situation. He was surrounded by his wives and kids. He was able to, uh, the couriers were bringing him stuff. They were printing off the internet. He was spending a lot of time writing very lengthy memos to Al Qaeda members. And this gets to what the extent to which he was in control of the organization. He was writing, um, he was communicating with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He, he said Anwar al Laki, the Yemeni American, uh, should not become the leader of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He was comfortable with the leadership that existed. He was sending notes to Al Shabaab in Somalia. Now, it's not clear if they ever got through, but he was certainly composing these. Uh, he said to Al Shabaab in Somalia, don't rename yourself Al Qaeda. It'll be bad for fundraising. It's going to attract a lot of negative attention. And by the way, stop attacking civilians in the middle of Mogadishu. And there was a lot of discussion within Al Qaeda about how damaging Al Qaeda in Iraq had been to them with, its camp with their campaign against Muslim civilians and how Al Qaeda, the brand, had been very damaged. Uh, a lot of discussion about how they were running out of money, a great deal of discussion about how damaging the CIA drone program was to their leadership. And bin Laden, in these memos that he was writing, I think showed a pretty good understanding of how badly damaged his organization was. Uh, his self-assessment of where they were was, would match with, I think, any reasonable person's assessment of where Al Qaeda was at the time. And he, uh, he had, was blue skying about you know, killing President Obama and killing General Petraeus for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, but these were clearly not serious plots. Uh, he had a lot of time on his hands uh, to write these memos. One of them it runs to 46 pages. Now, of course, you can read them all on West Point's uh, ca ca um, counterterrorism site. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the picture of where bin Laden was living, how he was living. Uh, so then let's switch focus to the question of how CIA found him. Um, and that is a quite involved story. Um, and there was no, there was a realization at the CIA from 2003, 2004, that there was going to be no detainee who knew where bin Laden was. There was going to be no detainee who was going to give them any really substantial help on that issue, even if they were waterboarded. Uh, there was going to be no detainee who, there was going to be no magic bullet. And that they basically needed to get back to kind of first principles to think about how, how to find bin Laden. It was going to, uh, and so um, there's a female analyst in the book, I, I name her, I think, Renee, who wrote a book and uh, wrote a, uh, a memo in 2005 saying um, it was entitled Pillars, and she said, on you know, we, should, we should basically look at all the intelligence we've collected already, and, 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 and we should look forward at any intelligence we gather in the future, and we should filter it through four basic pillars on which we shall place the bin Laden hunt. And one was communication. We might be able to find bin Laden through communication with the media. Uh, clearly, bin Laden was communicating with the media. He released 30 video and audio tapes at least after 9-11. Many of them went to Al Jazeera. They are physical products that had to be taken to Al Jazeera, to its bureau in Islamabad or its headquarters in Qatar. Uh, and Al Jazeera wasn't the only organization getting videotapes and audio tapes. They also went to other uh, networks. So could you trace back the chain of custody of these, of these tapes? 
uh, was one question. The second uh, possible method was to, um, it, was there any way to intercept uh, communications between bin Laden and his immediate family? Was there any way to gather information between bin Laden and other leaders of al-Qaeda? And was there any way to kind of just get inside the courier network that was clearly getting bin Laden's messages to various people? And it turned out that they could never intercept any messages going to Al Jazeera or any other me media organization. Or they, if they did intercept them, they could never tr tr trace the chain of custody past a certain number of cutouts along the way. Uh, bin Laden's immediate family was with him, so he had no need to communicate with them. With or at least some of his immediate family was always with him, so he didn't need to. You know, he was just talking to them, and he wasn't communicating with the other family members in Saudi Arabia at all. Uh, he was, they never intercepted anything that led them uh, to bin Laden through the other leadership uh, communications. So it, le it left them with the courier network. And this is where the story becomes more complicated because the question was who was the courier? And that took, uh, and, and when I tell you what the, the process is, uh, there are gaps in the story that I don't know the answer to, and I'm sure we'll find out more over time. The beginning of the story begins with this guy, um, Ahmed al Kuwaiti, uh, which is. He, uh, he would turn out to be the courier. Now, how was Ahmed al-Kuwaiti identified? Uh, it's a story that begins nine years before bin Laden is killed. A, the, the real 20th hijacker wasn't Zakiris Massawi in Minnesota, uh, who was uh, uh, practicing uh, flying uh, planes and was uh, detained because of his suspicious behavior at a flight school before 9-11. The, the real 20th hijacker was a guy called Mohammed al Qatani who was um, arrested in Orlando, no, sorry, he wasn't arrested, he was, he arrived at Orlando Airport in the summer of 2001. Waiting for him in the parking lot was Mohammed Atta, the leader of the hijackers, and uh, a, a, an immigration officer would, did, didn't buy Mohammed al Qatani's explanation for why he was in the United States. He ba barely spoke English, he had, was on a one-way one, one ticket, uh, he didn't have any good explanation about what he was planning to do, um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, immigration officer sent him back to his native Saudi Arabia. From there, he went to Afghanistan. Uh, he was in, at the Battle of Tora Bora. He fled into Pakistan. He was arrested in late December of 2001, and uh, he was sent to Guantanamo. In Guantanamo, he said that he was in Afghanistan because of his pressing interest in falconry, uh, which, of course, wasn't true. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he then... Um, at a certain point in the summer of 2002, he, he, the fingerprints of the guy who'd been uh, sent back from Orlando Airport and the guy who claimed he was in, interested in falconry turned out to be the same person. So he then became the subject of a great deal of uh, uh, law enforcement and, and other uh, uh, interest at Guantanamo, and he was subjected to a course of uh, coercive interrogations that, uh, in the words of Susan Crawford, who was a federal judge appointed by Ronald Reagan and then became the head of uh, the commissions at, uh, at, at Guantanamo under George W. Bush at that time, she said that his treatment amounted to torture and he could never be tried for anything. In fact, he won't be. Um, so what happened to him in the, f in the days that he was coercively interrogated? He, uh, he was basically kept up for about 40 plus days. And all of this is detailed in, a, in the Time Magazine piece, which uh, they got hold of his interrogation logs. Um, he was kept up for 40 days at least. Um, he uh, was subjected to extremes of hot and cold. He was forced to perform dog tricks. He had sometimes uh, stripped naked in the presence of females. He, uh, if he was falling asleep, he was given uh, loud doses of particularly annoying tracks by Christina Aguilera. He was uh, basically, uh, you know, he was, he was, um, anyway, so he was uh, definitely coercively interrogated. Now, he was, he, it's now, this is not clear. What, when, when this happened, and according to a 6,000-page report which the Senate Intelligence Committee is sitting on, still hasn't been declassified in any shape or form, um, you know, we, we may have better answers when this report comes out in an unclassified form, but either before, during, or after this, he said that the person who was kind of teaching him about uh, security within al-Qaeda uh, was a guy called Ahmed al-Kuwaiti and that this guy was clearly part of the inner circle of al-Qaeda. Now, Ahmed al-Kuwaiti is not a particularly useful clue because it means the father of Ahmed from Kuwait, and there are millions of Kuwaitis. Many of them have kids called Ahmed. However, it was the beginning of what would eventually lead to the courier. So fast forward to, actually in 2004, a guy called Hassan Ghul, who's an al-Qaeda courier sent from bin Laden to the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, basically telling him to kind of stop his campaign against uh, Iraqi civilians, 
uh, and, and Shia in particular, is picked up uh, in Kurdistan and according to a CIA officer who, uh, who was in charge of the hunt for Zakawi, during his time in Kurdish custody, he said that this guy Ahmed, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti not only was important in al-Qaeda, but was one of bin Laden's couriers. Fast forward another three years to 2007, uh, somehow the United States found out that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti's real name was Ibrahim Saeed. Now, Ibrahim Saeed wasn't a Kuwaiti, he was actually a Pakistani, complicating things. Uh, it was, he was a Pakistani who grew up in Kuwait, just like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Now, if you're, if you're a Pakistani living in Kuwait, Kuwait will never give you citizenship. So these were second generation Pakistanis who had grown up in Kuwait, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11, and this guy Ahmed, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. And they knew each other. Um, and they were part of the sort of inner circle of al-Qaeda. Ibrahim Saeed, uh, a Pakistani, uh, sort of a John Smith name in, in Pakistan, a country of almost 200 million people. But we're beginning to have the point where we now have a real name with the actual country where he's from. But there's no sense that this is going to, this is, this is the, this is bin Laden's, this is bin Laden's courier. There's a sense that this guy is maybe bin Laden, a courier of bin Laden, maybe important. Sometime in the summer of 2010, probably with, a, with the help of the Pakistanis, uh, perhaps inadvertent help, uh, a phone call from somebody that they believe to be the courier uh, takes place to somebody in the Gulf who they're tracking, who they believe to be at least perhaps part of al-Qaeda. The content of the conversation leads them to believe that the courier, whether we call him Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti al or Ibrahim Saeed, his real name, is still part of al-Qaeda and he's, living in, or he's making phone calls from Peshawar, Pakistan. That's still a very long way from finding him in Abdabad because Peshawar is two and a half drive, hours drive from Abdabad, and he turns his phone off. Not only turns his phone off, uh, he also takes the battery out at least an hour away from where he lives. So you can't track a phone with the battery taken out, even if you're the NSA. Um, and uh, so that requires basically putting people into Peshawar to track this guy when he is making phone calls in Peshawar and either put a tracking device on his vehicle or physically follow him back to his, to his house in Abdabad where he's living, which happens in the summer of 2010. The house uh, that, that the, the courier is living in is interesting because it doesn't have internet or phone service. The people there are burning their trash. They're also lying to their neighbors about who they are. Uh, they're all, in fact, even lying to their own family members about who they are, about, about what they're doing and where they're living. Um, and there is three families living in this house, one family taking exceptional efforts to avoid going out or being surveyed in any way. At that point, Liam Panetta, the CIA director, goes to Barack Obama in August of 2010 and basically tells him, we have a very good lead on this house that suggests bin Laden could be there. There are no high fives in the Oval Office, and there's probably a group of maybe five or six people who know at this point in the, in the White House. Um, Tom Donilon, Dennis McDonough, the Vice President, the Vice President's National Security Advisor, Tony Blinken, uh, John Brennan, uh, the President's uh, 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 Counterterrorism Advisor, and that's really it. Uh, at the beginning. Tom Donilon has said there's a, one way to keep a secret in Washington, don't tell anybody. Um, and that, of course, is true. Uh, and they were very, very careful about, uh, about uh, any kind of, uh, they were very, very careful with this information. And there were some people in the White House who noticed there were meetings that were happening. They're, called, they're actually called non-meetings, uh, where, where which meetings where you don't bring, there are no read-ahead papers, you can't bring a second, uh, the uh, cameras in the Situation Room are turned off. And there were a number of these non-meetings that began happening uh, with greater frequency over time. And in these meetings, uh, there was a discussion about the intelligence, the quality of the intelligence, uh, about whether bin Laden was there. And, uh, you know, there was a range of, uh, there was, you know, it was a circumstantial case that bin Laden was living there where they never got a picture of bin Laden, they never got a satellite image, they never, there was nobody who said, there was no cook who worked at the house who said, I just saw you know, a six foot four Arab guy looking a lot like bin Laden. There was nothing like that. Um, and Panetta was quite frustrated and kept pushing for better information. Uh, at one point he said, um, well, if we can't get a picture of bin Laden, maybe we can get a picture, we can measure his shadow and get a sense of how tall he is since we know he's six foot four. So the National Geospatial Imagery 
measured his shadow and came back and said it's a man between five foot three and six foot eight. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Jeremy Bash, who was Leon Panetta's chief of staff, went to the Bin Laden unit and said, you know, the boss really wants you to be creative here and come up with 25 ideas. They can be as crazy as you want that show that you are thinking creatively about how we can get better information or a photograph or something out of this house. So they came up with, I think, 38 ideas, some of which are clearly, um, you know, were, 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 were fanciful, one of which was to throw stink bombs into the compound and flush people out. Another one was to broadcast in Arabic the voice of Allah commanding uh, the inhabitants of the, of the compound to leave. Um, and then another one which did happen, which was both creative and ethically dubious, which was the amount of vaccination campaign in, in Abtabad, which would base, basically recruit a Pakistani doctor, have a hepatitis B vaccination campaign be conducted. Uh, the doctor was recruited. He got some nurses. He began the campaign in a poor part of town so it wouldn't arouse any suspicion. And the idea was that they would get into the Bin Laden neighborhood, which was more of a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood, get DNA from one of the kids, match it to existing DNA of the Bin Laden family in the United States, and, you know, bingo. But that never happened. And, of course, this was a very dumb idea in Pakistan because in Pakistan, as you know, it's one of the very few countries with polio uh, is not, has not been eradicated, and polio workers are regarded as agents of the CIA by elements of the Taliban. And this program, I think, has certainly endangered um, health workers in Pakistan because it seems to confirm uh, a Pakistani conspiracy theory uh, that vaccination programs are conducted by the CIA, because in this case it was. Um, so none of this really amounted to much in terms of trying to get better intelligence. Um, the CIA was basically faced with a cash 22, which was the way to get better intelligence was to take more, to be more visible on the target, to you know do more obvious surveillance, more people knocking on the door, and basically that might have spooked the target, which they didn't want, did not want to do. And so um, the circumstantial case, they, uh, you know, the, hanging over this all was the uh, the weapons of mass destruction fiasco in Iraq, which was a circumstantial mm -hmm. case that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. And uh, since then, the agency has been more careful about, uh, has a whole sort of set of protocols to come up with alternative explanations for the same set of information. So when people looked at the evidence for bin Laden living in this compound, they also came up with alternative explanations. Could this be somebody in Al-Qaeda who was retired? Could this be another person in Al-Qaeda? Could this be a drug dealer that a re recruited a member of Al-Qaeda to act as a courier? Could this be bin Laden's family without him? The list was fairly long for alternative explanations. Uh, and at a certain point, Mike Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA, briefed uh, President Obama and kind of told him everything I've just told you, essentially. And uh, Obama said, look, why, you know, why are you at 60% probability that bin Laden is in this compound and others, other of your analysts are at 80%? Um, and Morrell said, look, I lived through the uh, Iraq weapons of mass destruction fiasco. I'm very leery, as are many people uh, who live through that, of a circumstantial case. And in fact, Mr. President, um, the circumstantial case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction is a better circumstantial case than bin Laden living in this compound. So uh, that is a pretty, um, if I was the president, uh, that would give me a great deal of pause. Um, and, you know, this is an, I think this will be, just as President Kennedy's decisions in the Cuban Missile Crisis is kind of a, kind of a case study of presidential decision making coming in a very difficult situation, coming up with the, uh, the best possible solution. I think that people, historians, will look back on this very similarly because um, you're making decisions uh, based on imperfect information. Um, and it's very easy for an analyst to say there's a 40% chance of bin Laden's in, in, in Abtabad or at 80%. But when you make the decision, he's either 100% not there or he's 100% there. Uh, there's no 40% chance that he's there. Uh, and you have to, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. Uh, and in our system, you make the decision alone. And five days after my book first came out, uh, Mitt Romney said that any president, including Jimmy Carter, would have made this decision. And I didn't know when I was writing the book that that would be one of the responses that people would have to this issue. Um, and, you know, President Carter did make a form of this decision. It, made, it, it substantially contributed to the fact that he was a one-term president. And hanging over all the, decision, all the discussions in the National Security Council meetings was a Democratic president who'd authorized a risky special operations uh, operation on the other side of the world in a country that wasn't uh, 
that was inimical to American interests and that it contributed to basically his one-term presidency. And every time uh, there was a meeting, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, who had started working for the Nixon White House when President Obama was 12, would make the following point, uh, that I was in the White House that night that that operation went down. He was the executive assistant to CIA Director Stansfield Turner, a 41-year-old CIA officer. Uh, as you know, everything that could go wrong with this, this operation did go wrong. Uh, the helicopter, helicopters and AC-130s crashed, seven American servicemen died. Uh, it was a huge fiasco. And it was, by the way, an entirely predictable fiasco because each of the elements of the armed services wanted to be involved in this big, important operation, the Marines, the Army, the Air Force. Um, and uh, they had never rehearsed this kind of operation together. I sat next to uh, 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 then Vice President Hubert Humphrey uh, recently at a, a, a lunch in Minneapolis, and I was asking him about this operation. He said one of the big problems about the operation, it was all – Everything was so top secret that a lot of people involved didn't really understand how the operation all fit together. And the reason I mention all this is Joint, Joint Special Operations Command, which is the, op the command that did the bin Laden raid, came out of that fiasco in the Iranian desert in 1980. There was a realization you couldn't do these operations unless there was, uh, you know, people continuously practiced together and, 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 and understood how, 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 how each other worked. So Joint Special Operations Command was founded uh, coming out of the defeat uh, of the, the disaster of Operation Desert Storm, uh, Desert One, Operation Eagle Claw, sometimes it's referred to. And it was Joint Special Operations Command that did the, uh, the bin Laden raid. Now, the evolution of JSOC, as it's referred to, is an interesting story because this was, uh, JSOC was really a counter-terrorist organization but was never deployed before 9-11 to go after bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. And why was that? Well, you know, paradoxically, uh, or maybe not paradoxically, the Pentagon was extremely re reluctant to authorize any kind of mission uh, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, uh, Steve Cole, my friend and colleague, uh, in, in his book Ghost Wars, quotes President Clinton basically saying, you know, wouldn't it scare Al-Qaeda if the Black Ninjas sort of came down in their camps and sort of did their thing? Um, and what happened with the conventional army was very suspicious of special operations forces, particularly in the wake of, wake of the Battle of Mogadishu, where 18 American servicemen were killed in 1993. And every time an operation was sort of suggested of this kind, they would basically uh, keep having it, you know, having it up, meaning suggesting more and more p people involved. So politically, it became untenable. Suddenly, it looked like the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, when it really needed to be a small team to go in and basically take out uh, bin Laden before 9-11. Uh, anyway, suffice it to say that never happened. So Joint Special Operations Command, ironically, which was essentially a counterterrorism force, was never used before 9-11. And uh, it really became, uh, it sort of came to its uh, kind of potential during the Iraq War. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal turned that organization into, he's, uh, I quote him in the book saying basically, you know, I, I needed to turn a bookstore into Amazon. And, and what he meant by that was to, instead of uh, an organization that did maybe one or two operations a month, suddenly it was doing 300 operations a month. And so, ben, so uh, President Obama was very comfortable with the abilities of Joint Special Operations. One of the very first decisions he made in office was the, the decision to authorize deadly force in the case of Captain Richard Phillips in Somalia, uh, the subject of the Tom Hanks film. And you know, this was a flawless military operation. Tom, uh, after President Obama authorized the use of deadly force, um, Captain Phillips was on the boat for five days. There was a moment where his life seemed to be in danger. Three Navy SEALs, sh at, at a di as, as night fell, at a distance of 30 yards in heaving, in heaving seas, shot each of these three pirates with one shot each. So kind of a spectacular military uh, feat uh, that surely would have impressed President Obama and certainly impressed uh, him uh, about the abilities of Admiral Bill McRaven, the head of JSOC, who was the architect of the bin Laden operation. So the, the military component was not something that President Obama had to worry over, overly much about. The same night that the bin Laden raid went down, there were 12 other operations in Afghanistan uh, with Joint Special Operations Command, that would, some of which would have been technically more difficult. But he did have to worry about a lot of other things. And uh, the big thing, of course, he had to worry about was the reaction of the Pakistanis. Um, as the intelligence picture didn't really improve, um, 
there came a point where you have to say, what are we going to do about it? We know the intelligence isn't going to improve, so how do we, what are we going to do, if anything? And it really came down to five choices, one of which was, let's do a joint operation with the Pakistanis. Now, that had happened in the past, the arrest of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11 was a joint U.S.-Pakistan relations uh, 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 um, uh, operation. But relations between the two countries were at that nadir. Uh, you may recall Raymond Davis, a U.S. Uh, well, a CIA contractor killed two Pakistanis in broad daylight, uh, January 28th, uh, 2011. Um, we, the United States government, President Obama, said all sorts of misleading things about who he was, that he was a State Department official, diplomatic cover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out he was a CIA contractor, which was pretty obvious because this was a guy who, you know, basically took out two people with two shots, uh, had, you know, was huge bulging muscles, uh, wasn't, you know, didn't look like a diplomat, um, and, uh, and of course, so that, that again confirmed a Pakistani conspiracy theory that their country is just a wash in CIA folks going around killing Pakistanis, and uh, so it, um, the relations were bad, and the, there was concerns that a U.S.-Pakistani operation, the, the details, would leak. Another idea was to drop a, you know, to, to bomb the compound. Uh, when people looked at what it would take, it was a B-52 raid. Would, would, to destroy this compound would require 32 500-pound bombs. James Cartwright, who was President Obama's favorite general by Bob, Woods, Bob Woodward's description, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, pointed out that this would be like having an earthquake going off in a fairly large Pakistani city. You couldn't prove to yourself if you killed bin Laden, you'd be bombing an ally, there'd be civilian casualties, uh, you know, if this was dismissed out of hand fairly quickly. Another idea which had certain a number of adherents was to use a drone strike using a small experimental drone. No one would tell me what exactly that was, but I could tell from the way that people described it that this was not something that the U.S. Air Force uh, was using. And as I looked into it, it looked like something that Raytheon had developed, a nine-pound bomb. You know, the smallest bomb the U.S. Air Force drops is 500 pounds. So a nine-pound bomb, uh, it had never been used in combat before. Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, was very skeptical of this idea, uh, using sort of relying on technology. The, dro the, the experimental drone had a number of advantages uh, as an idea. One, um, if you did the drone strike, whoever was in this compound wasn't going to complain about it. They were clearly trying to keep a very low profile. So it would probably be pretty deniable. Um, but there were also problems with, the, uh, with it. You couldn't pick up any intelligence with the drone strike uh, at the compound. You uh, might miss the target. Uh, people survived drone strikes. Um, and uh, so there were, there were a d number of people who thought it was a good idea, a number of people who didn't. There was, of course, the US Navy SEALs uh, boots on the ground uh, idea. And there was also the very tempting human idea about let's just wait and see if we can get anything better about the intelligence before we make a decision. And let's just defer this decision as long as possible. But there were costs even in delay, because the longer you delay, the more people are knowing about what's going on, or they know something's going on. So once you start operationalizing a military operation like SEALs on the, you know, a Navy SEAL operation, for, you have to have people practicing the operation. They practiced in North Carolina for a month in April. Then they had a much bigger rehearsal in Nevada, and more and more people are finding out about this. And you, there are concerns about leaks, and in fact, you have to bring in people who are going to deal with the leaks. So Ben Rhodes was brought in because there were concerns. We, need, we, may, need, we may need to talk to newspaper editors to tell him or her, you know, why not to, you know, to, to hold this story. Uh, they brought in George Little, who was a, he's just been, the, uh, just stepped down as the head of public affairs at the Pentagon, who was the head of public affairs at CIA. Basically, we need also to think about how, we need to think about how we explain this to America, the American people if it goes wrong. And so they produced a 66-page uh, unclassified version of the intelligence that they could explain to everybody uh, in the event that the operation didn't work. Anyway, so more and more people are finding out. There are five National Security Council meetings to discuss uh, the, the issue. The last, is the last uh, uh, meeting is on April the 28th, 2011. During the meeting, uh, President Obama goes around the table and asks people for their opinions. Some of you already knows the opinions of some. Uh, Bob Gates, the Defense Secretary, says basically I'm against. Uh, not only is this circumstantial evidence, and I've seen too many circumstances. He was, of course, the former director of the CIA himself. I've seen too many circumstantial cases fall apart. What happens if the Pakistanis close off our supply routes to Afghanistan, which uh, every, every you know, 90 percent of at that time of the materiel going to U.S. and NATO troops is transiting Pakistani airspace or Pakistani land. 
um, and uh, you know, and reminded everybody about the, the op Operation Desert Desert One. Senator Joe Biden, who'd become a senator when President Obama was 13, also said that he was against uh, the raid uh, for all the reasons I've just outlined, and he was also concerned about an attack on the U.S. Embassy in 1979. An enraged Pakistani mob had burnt the embassy to the ground, uh, concerned about that kind of reaction. Um, and of course, all, you know, SEALs being, uh, they, there was a concern that you could have 24 Raymond Davises who were suddenly in Pakistani prisons or, or, pack, or a firefight with the Pakistani military and civilian casualties. James Cartwright, uh, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, advocated for the experimental drone strike. On the other side of the issue, Admiral Mike Mullen had attended the final rehearsal in Nevada, uh, the full dress rehearsal where they flew in for an hour to the target uh, at night, did the raid, and flew out again for another hour. Uh, he was uh, in favor, he, he, he shaked every hand of the SEALs involved. He uh, had a great faith in Admiral McRaven. He was in favor of the raid. And that's unusual where the vice chairman and the chairman have two different, uh, essentially two different pieces of military advice for the president. Um, Liam Panetta was always in favor of the raid. And uh, Hillary Clinton, who of course was senator, uh, uh, senator from New York on September 11th and visited Ground Zero on September 12th, gave a long and loyally exposition of both the pros and the cons of uh, everything that was being suggested and then came down on the raid as well. And so at seven o'clock the meeting is finished. President Obama goes back to his quarters at the White House and at 8.20 the following morning comes out and authorizes the mission, uh, tells Tom Donnell and Dennis McDonough uh, it's a go. Uh, we all know how it uh, turned out. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I was the only person uh, to get into the compound to get a look at it and it was useful to also reconstruct what happened the night of the raid because there's physical evidence you can see about what the SEALs did that night that I was able to see, uh, for instance, which, which doors they blew through. Uh, they had to blow through a huge 20-foot door on the ground floor to get to the second and third floors uh, where bin Laden lived. There was a, also a very large door on the third floor preventing in, entrance into bin Laden's bedroom. Uh, they didn't blow through that because bin Laden had sort of poked his head out and uh, was either confused or sort of in a hurry and, and didn't close it behind him. Bin Laden had 15 minutes to surrender. A helicopter had uh, crash-landed in his house, which was a pretty loud event. Uh, he had uh, told his wives, we now know the Americans have arrived. So he knew that the jig was up. Uh, he, if he had conspicuously surrendered, it would have been a war crime to shoot him, uh, as it would be in any uh, US military operation. Uh, he didn't surrender. He had two guns in his room. He didn't reach for them. He may have been paralyzed by indecision, fear, uh, surprise. Uh, who knows? Clearly, uh, he didn't expect this to happen. He didn't have a plan B. He didn't, uh, there was no safe, ha safe room in the house. Uh, there was no uh, tunnel out. The CIA was concerned there might be a tunnel out, but when they looked at the water table, it's very high in that part of the country, and there was no way there could be a tunnel. Uh, his, uh, he, you know, he may have been concerned about having a firefight in an enclosed space with uh, his wives and kids around him. Anyway, he, the point is he put up no resistance. And what was very interesting to me was his death was greeted by basically indifference in the, in the Muslim world. Um, you know, I think bin Laden by then had basically, his, his moment had sort of come and gone. His claim that Al-Qaeda represents, uh, you know, is, is defending Muslims, I think had been very largely undercut by Al-Qaeda's activities in Iraq, something he himself understood, uh, because this is a group that killed most, you know, literally tens of thousands of Muslim civilians uh, during the Iraq war uh, in suicide attacks. Um, and he had become irrelevant. Now, did, did that mean that it wasn't important to capture or kill him? Uh, of course not. For the victims of 9-11, their families, for the restoration of American national honor, I think these were all very important uh, uh, you know, to, fi to finally find him. And when, the, when it happened, I was on CNN and Wolf Blitzer asked me immediately after the president stopped talking, what's your reaction? And I obviously didn't have any time to rehearse this because I didn't know <laughs> that would be his question. I didn't even know that bin Laden was dead necessarily until the president confirmed it. And I said, you know, the war on terror is over. Uh, we can basically announce that. And, and by, what, by that, I didn't mean that terrorism was over, but I mean, I meant the war on terror, capital W, capital T, is over. At the end of the day, if the Taliban had handed over bin Laden, we wouldn't have been in, Af in Afghanistan and we wouldn't have been in Iraq, in my view. I mean, I think history would have been very different. And, you know, bin Laden, 9-11 was his strategic idea. I believe in a very old-fashioned old view of history, which is 
you know, certain people change history. And it's very hard to explain why the French were at the gates of Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon and an understanding of his personality and ego. I think it's very hard to explain the Holocaust without Hitler. And I, I think it's impossible to explain 9-11 without bin Laden because it was his strategic conception. And it was his, um, he had a very naive, naive idea about the United States is that we would, if we were subjected to enough violent pressure, that we would pull out of the Middle East uh, quite the reverse happened. Uh, he based that, on, and he told this to me when I when we interviewed him in 1997. You know that the United States is a paper tiger, and they're like the former Soviet Union. If you, if you know, they will. You know, they fear death, and we love. Uh, you know, uh, we love death, and and these kinds of kind of sloganeerings. He uh, he misunderstood completely uh, a light what the American reaction would be to to 9/11, and. We all thought of it at the time as uh, sort of like Pearl Harbor. Yes, it was very like Pearl Harbor. It was a great tactical victory for Al-Qaeda, which led ineluctably to their strategic defeat, just as Pearl Harbor was a great tactical victory for the Japanese, but within four years caused the collapse of Imperial Japan. Al-Qaeda means the base in Arabic. They lost the best base they ever had as a result of 9-11. I have Afghan friends who were watching 9-11 as it happened, and they were happy is the wrong word they were cognizant of the fact that they could be liberated from the Taliban because of this attack. Uh, you know, if you do the thought experiment where there's no 9-11, there's no reason why the Taliban wouldn't be in control of Afghanistan today. So the whole thing was a strategic failure for bin Laden. And I think, you know, Al-Qaeda, the organization that attacked us on 9-11 is, is on life support, which of course doesn't mean that there won't be people inspired by bin Laden's message, as we saw in Boston. Uh, if you look at what Jahar Tassaniyev was scrawling in the boat just before he thought he was going to be killed, he basically was scrawling a version of bin Laden's principal message, which was the United States, the West, led by the United States, is at war with Islam, and we need to kind of take revenge on the U.S. And that very simple message will have rev resonance with, you know, at least a very small minority of young men, because almost invariably they're young men, um, and bin Laden's message will live on. Uh, but I think there are fewer and fewer takers uh, for the message. Al-Qaeda in Syria is certainly a, a big concern uh, because they seem to have learned from the mistakes that Al-Qaeda in Iraq had. Uh, but I think the long-term prognosis for, these, for, this, for this group and this ideology is pretty poor. So with that, I'll take any questions. Mr. Bergen, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, second of all, I, um, you just um, mentioned this quote that I wanted to question you about, declared the global war of terror over after Bin Laden died. Um, what, how would you characterize what's going on right now? Uh, you have a new Tal Taliban leader in Pakistan. You have the stuff going on in Yemen, Somalia, all over. Um, what, what would you? What would be your characterization of what's going on right now? Yeah, one way of answering that is on May 23rd, President Obama gave a speech at the National Defense University, <coughs> which um, I think was a very important speech. It was the first really big speech about answering your, the question you've just asked. Uh, you know, he's done speeches about Guantanamo. He's done speeches about elements of this. But this was his first big speech about national security, counterterrorism. And what he, what he wanted, I think, during that speech was to begin a discussion about do we want to be in a permanent state of war? Does the United States want to be in a permanent state of war? Which, by the way, I don't think is something that is a particularly American concept, um, and I don't think is pretty either, and, and isn't a particularly desirable one. Um, and wars shouldn't go on forever. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that the threat from Al Qaeda is going to be zero, um, but it does mean that we should. You know, the threat from Al Qaeda is clearly receded. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there's a new leader of the Pakistani Taliban, which is certainly very bad news for Pakistan, but is kind of probably not a huge issue for the United States once we remove combat troops from Afghanistan. Now, the president, who after all is a constitutional law professor, in this speech talked about the authorization for the use of military force, which is the congressional authorization to use military force after 9-11, which authorized the war in Afghanistan. Now, nobody voting for that, and it passed with only one no vote uh, at the time, realized that this was going to authorize America's longest war, that it was going to authorize military operations in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and potentially any other place in the world where Al Qaeda or its allies exist. And I think that the president was trying to say in the speech that we need to have a discussion about sort of winding this down. And um, that doesn't mean that if Hillary Clinton is president or if Jeb Bush is president or whoever is president in 2016, that they wouldn't be able to take um, action, military action against forces within Al Qaeda that pose an imminent threat to the United States. Uh, because after all, Bill Clinton did that uh, with the embassy attacks in 1998. He didn't need an authorization of uh, war authorization to go after bin Laden's camps in 98 in Afghanistan. So. I think the president was right to start having that conversation, and the reason that he started this conversation now, rather than in December 2014 when combat troops, U.S. combat troops leave Afghanistan, is that it takes a long time to change things in Washington. Arguably, you know, things will never change, but um, I think it's a, the right discussion to be having. Uh, of course, there would be certain outcomes of such a decision. If we said we're no longer in a state of war, what do we do with the 40 plus people in Guantanamo who have not been charged with a crime but are regarded as being too dangerous to release? Since right now they're held under the laws of war, um, what do you do with them? To what extent would this impact the US drone program? Because many of the authorizations that authorize the program, particularly in Pakistan, are associated with the authorization for the use of military force. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be an easy discussion, uh, but I think it's certainly a worthwhile one. Uh, you, you write about in the book um, the time that bin Laden is in Afghanistan and his sort of seemingly tenuous relationship with Mullah Omar. And I, I just wanted to ask you, maybe you can kind of expand on it a little bit more. Uh, it seems really interesting because you write how right after 9-11, bin Laden seems a little nervous about taking responsibility because he doesn't want to put Mullah Omar in this position of, you know, oh, what do we do with this guy? Do we give him up or not? Um, but at the same time, Omar had talked about, even before 9-11, okay, we're not going to give him up and, you know, we're going to protect him and... I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how their relationship really worked and if it was respect or if it was just Omar trying to protect his own interests. And Yeah, I mean, let's start with the fact, let's start with Mullah Omar, who uh, is still with us uh, somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, Mullah Omar is a village mullah. And by the way, in Afghan sort of uh, social hierarchy, that was a very, very low position to have uh, historically. Uh, a deeply unsophisticated guy um, when he owned, on, in the five years that he ran Afghanistan, he only visited Kabul, the capital, twice. He stayed in Kandahar. When a visiting delegation of Chinese diplomats <coughs> came to give him a gift, uh, it was a like figurine, you know. He reacted in horror as if they'd sort of, you know, attacked his wife uh, because he, you know, the whole concept of a of a of an animal figurine was reprehensible to him. So. I think Mullah Omar was a very unsophisticated guy who kind of got lucky um, and um, his relationship with bin Laden, you know, was based on he respected bin Laden's, uh, the fact that bin Laden fought during the Afghan war. But, you know, bin Laden didn't really respect him in any meaningful way because he didn't clue him in about, I mean, bin Laden led to the fall of the Taliban regime. Um, and uh, so, and, and basically lied about what he was doing. So I think their relationship was, you know, Bin Laden just sort of manipulated Mullah Omar. And if you look back, in fact, in some ways the dress rehearsal, for, I mean, it, 
you know, I mean, the, the fact that Mullah Omar destroyed this, the great Buddha statues in Bamiyan, which have been there for 1,500 years, I mean, this was definitely, those statues have been there for 1,500 years, including the seven or 800 years that Afghanistan's been a Muslim country. No one has paid any, you know, no one's touched them. So it was, it was really the sort of Wahhabi bin Laden ideas that, that led to their destruction. Yes, you are one of the few people that met with Ben Laden, the, a, a journalist that met with Ben Laden. Uh, after the official interview or before, were you able to somehow speak with the individual? Was he able to uh, deal with you as a, as a person or it was just business and that's it? It was mostly business. You know, a friend of mine uh, made a film based on this book for HBO, and he found footage that I didn't know existed, which is sort of kind of a little, it was footage that was shot before and after the interview, and, you know, it shows Bin Laden relaxing and having a cup of tea, and he's sort of kicking back, and he's sort of laughing a little bit. Uh, um, so, you know, he, but we didn't have, it wasn't, we didn't have a substantial interaction. We had a cup of tea with him, and it wasn't a sort of warm and fuzzy meeting. It uh, wasn't hostile either. I mean, he was there to do his interview and we were there to film it. Um, so, you know, my reaction to him was he seemed well-informed and intelligent, serious. The people around him seemed serious. They, a lot of them spoke English. They were educated. Some of them didn't speak in English. They're sort of guards who seemed to be from a different social class, but a lot of the people in you know, who were dealing with us were, high, you know, quite educated. Uh, but, you know, I didn't, it was an hour and a half in his company. It was not, you know, wasn't time to really assess what he's like personally. I did then spend many years invest, you know, talking to his friends and family about him, colleagues, acquaintances. And, uh, you know, a fairly universal picture emerges, which is this guy is fairly humble, never raised his voice, didn't seem like he'd be much of a leader, in meetings when he was in his 20s, he barely, you know, he'd be in a room for hours without saying anything. And so what changed, I think, um, I think the, you know, the big change is that I think when he went into Afghanistan in 1985, he started fighting the Soviets personally. I think that changed him. He took a lot of risks. He uh, subjected the people he was with to a lot of risk. Uh, they, these were 21-year-old, 22-year-old Saudi under you know, university graduates. None of them had an idea about how to fight. And they came there to die. They didn't come there to fight, in a way. Um, but I think that experience changed him. And by, 90, by the time he was about 30, he founded Al-Qaeda in 1988. He was um, 29. And by then, he had sort of the courage of his own convictions. And a lot of people told him. His old friends started leaving him around this time, saying, you know, you don't have any military expertise. Why you find, you know, you shouldn't be involved in recruiting people for a military organization. So I think that, that experience seems to be a, something that's made him change. Can I, can I ask yeah, yeah. I, I need the mic. Yeah. So w one frivolous question and one um, reasonably serious. I, I, I thought that when he was captured, there was a cache of porn so that, uh, you know, he was watching Peter Bergen on CNN and, and doing you know what with his porn. So, but it, it, it's not mentioned, and I just wondered whether that was totally apocryphal um, up there on the third floor of the compound. Yeah, I, I think that was a very rare instance of effective information operations by the CIA. I <laughs> see, they put it out. Yeah. Wow. No, I, just, I don't think that that I, doesn't fit with him. No. No, I know it was odd. The, the the other the just about torture. I mean, you 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 show and you talked in, in your talk in, in in your presentation, but also in the book about how, how Greystone Operation Greystone started right after CIA, after 9/11, uh, uh, authorized by uh, <clears throat> uh, by Bush, and just you know one person after another, everybody was tortured, and these coercive and, and, and you you described some of them just now, but the 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 role of torture in the process of the hunt for bin Laden is extraordinary. And, and, and I guess sort of what do you think about that? But also, it, it would be, uh, it, it would be uh, according to your narrative, unimaginable that they would have caught him without torturing everybody along the way who uh, 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 led to some clues that eventually ended up in the compound. I'm very sorry if I gave you that impression. <laughs> 
because that that was not i mean i try to sort this out in the book to the best of my ability and you know much of the information is not you know that you need to make a final determination is in public and i mentioned the 6000 page report that the senate intelligence committee they've spent they've i think looked at 6 million documents it's been a 3 year process i mean this and it's led by senator Diane feinstein and she's been fairly clear along with senator uh, chuck levin who's also part of the uh, task force that uh, co coercive interrogation i use the word term coercive interrogation in the book rather than torture because i think torture is vague and means a lot of different things to different people but no one could die, deny that people were coercively interrogated they say that coercive interrogations did not lead to bin Laden, and I, I think that's a pretty defensible statement. Certainly, people in the book who gave up information about bin Laden were coercively interrogated. The question is, when did they give the information up? And until we have the actual chronology, that's going to be a hard thing to answer. But the people that I mentioned in the book, it's quite possible that they gave up information uh, before they were coercively interrogated. Uh, in fact, and we know, look, Abu Zubaydah, who was the first main al-Qaeda leader, he gave up the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the operational commander of 9-11 to Ali Sufan long before he was coercively interrogated. Uh, so it's true that a lot of people in the book are coercively interrogated. The question is, how useful was it? And a lot of the, and if you take, to, if you look at all the kind of leads that came from the book, uh, that, that got you to bin Laden, Many of the leads came from very traditional uh, things that had nothing to do with interrogation. So, so how did we find the real name? Ibrahim Said was that he was a Pakistani. I mean, I don't, I don't have a definitive answer for that, but I presume the Pakistanis gave it to us because they would be in a position to know. How do we track down the phone call in the summer of 2011 that indicated that this guy was still part of Al Qaeda? It was the National Security Agency, not interrogation. How did we find the compound in Abtabad? We had spies on the ground, people we recruited who followed him back. So in the book, in, in fact, the hunt for bin Laden involved every imaginable intelligence technique, including interrogations, some perhaps coercive and some not. Um, and it was a sum of all these things uh, that led to bin Laden, including, I think, just some really good deductive reasoning uh, to think about how how do you find somebody who's taking these efforts not to uh, not to be found one of the things I look at in the book and that the CIA also looked at is what were the lessons of other manhunts that you could apply to this and they were not exact but you know how did the Israelis find Eichmann was a big interesting question and that, that, that involved uh, Eichmann's son had a girlfriend and he was kind of bragging about what his dad did in the war to the girlfriend's dad and the girlfriend's dad had a friend who was a prosecutor of former Nazis in Germany and somehow the Mossad got hold of the content of that conversation and of course kidnapped Eichmann. Um, so I think in all these cases, um, you know, there's, there's usually a variety of methods that, that get people caught I knew, you know, bin Laden was a human being and he was going to get caught eventually because he wanted to be in control. If he didn't, if he stopped communicating with anybody, he would not have, he'd still be alive today. Sorry. Thanks for, so much for um, um, being here, uh, Peter. The, uh, your book um, is read like a, um, like a breathtaking thriller. Thank and you. But <laughs> But at the end of the day, as an academician, um, we tend to kill those kind of stories and, and parse them. And I'm thinking, I found myself thinking along the same lines as um, Chuck. I wanted to ask about torture, but if we take the, the manhunt, and now I'm going to devoid it of a, any uh, fictional um, or any like really storytelling uh, interest, and just look at it as a case study in counterterrorism. Um, just because it is very visible, very um, well executed, very well detailed. Um, then the, we have the um, question of the torture that um, Chuck stole. Um, uh, and then there is the idea of um, Al-Kuwaiti. Um, it was by some sort of a surveillance um, that Al-Kuwaiti was um, you know, discovered. And I'm thinking, 
one of the things that I was thinking reading it is how much would that contact be within an NSA, um, you know, larger circle versus the NSA more, um, you know, how much would it would that contact be considered a civilian rather than a known um, terrorist? That's one thing. The other um, is um, and and so on and so forth. There are there yeah. are many other things. So we have the, the question of torture. We have the question of surveillance. Um, I also had another point that I forget from just now. Oh, and the um, and how much was it worth to? Um, one of the things that really is um, uh, disappointing is the um, breach of trust with the uh, vaccination. I mean, the WHO yeah. um, uh, severely uh, protested this. Um, yeah. Well, look, I mean, I, I, starting from the back of those questions, I mean, the Pakistan, I mean, as I think I indicated in the talk, I think it's uh, that was um, creative, but ethically dubious and very counterproductive. Um, it didn't work. And it, it, you know, it's created an environment where polio workers are being killed by the Taliban uh, with the justification that these are agents of the CIA. So I don't know. I mean, I went to Abbottabad and I talked to, went to hospitals where people were familiar with, I mean, it was, you know, no one would talk about people, you know, pa Pakistan, the, the intelligence agencies are very, and it was a difficult reporting environment. But, but clearly, I think they, they vaccinated a neighborhood of kids at least, and maybe two. Um, and they recruited a number of nurses. So it was a, you know, it was a, and by the way, this guy is no hero. I mean, so there's a narrative on the right that this guy helped find Bin Laden. That's total nonsense. He, uh, President Obama said he didn't tell his own wife uh, about this. Uh, I, I find that a little hard to believe being married myself, but, um, <laughs> but I think that was, he certainly didn't tell Valerie Jarrett or any, there was nobody in the White House who on the, nobody knew. So, in the same way, why would you, this Pakistani doctor they recruited wasn't told, hey, you're part of a plan to find Osama bin Laden. He was told, we are paying you like a few thousand bucks to run this false vaccination program. Or in fact, it was a real vaccination program in Abbottabad. All you need to know is that we're paying you and we're the CIA and that's it. So this guy, this guy is no hero. He's in prison for 33 years on um, unrelated charges of supporting the Taliban. Um, you know, and when people say, well, we sh this guy should be out of prison, I have two, a two-word answer, which is Jonathan Pollard, who's a Israeli, you know, spying for the Israelis, an American citizen, is still in U.S. prison, despite the efforts of the Israelis to get him out for decades now. So I agree with you the, that it was inexcusable. In the 1970s Church Commission, you know, the CIA was no longer supposed to use journalists as cover or priests or these other things. So I Peace think it's... Peace Corps. Say what? Peace Corps. Peace Corps. All these things. So the question of NSA, you know, I, I think uh, it's hard to tell, but I'm pretty confident two things. First of all, the Pakistanis were helpful to the United States in finding in, in this arena because they were looking, they told me that they were looking at a network of people within Al-Qaeda who were speaking, um, one particular person who was speaking in a, both in Arabic and Pashto, which is sort of unusual, and that they were helping with this, and I think that's very plausible. So that's not an NSA bulk surveillance type thing, that's a liaison relationship with another intelligence agency. I don't think, this is not bulk surveillance. I don't, no one has a problem with um, the NSA spying on members of Al-Qaeda who are, or people they have a belief are in Al-Qaeda. Where the issue arises is we're gonna, that's like looking for a particular needle because you know the needle might be worth looking at. What people have a problem is creating a giant haystack that there may be a needle in someday. I mean, that's where the problem arises. And I'm pretty confident that bulk surveillance had nothing to do with this operation. But, you know, it's hard to make these judgments with any, spec you know, without the actual information. Just to summarize, though, yeah. one of the conclusions of your book would be that the, um, the current counterterrorism um, policy, including the use of torture, use of what animal they
Well, yes and no. I mean, look, I, 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 my book is not a his series of lessons learned. Um, it's a narrative, as you point out. And I mean, and, and you know, there's a reason that narratives work because we're sort of programmed to, to find them interesting. And uh, life is complex, but also, well, no, but I think, I think more than that. I mean, look, there's, I don't think, you know, the, the two of the greatest historians of, uh, of the English speaking world were Gibbon and Macaulay, both of whom wrote very well and wrote stories that people found interesting. It didn't mean that the fall, rise and fall of the Roman Empire was a bad book, uh, nor did it mean that the history of England by Macaulay was a bad book. So I don't think that there is a necessary distinction between something that is both accurate and useful and well written. But it wasn't, I wasn't attempting to, I was trying to let the reader make their own judgments and you've made, one, you've made some judgments from it. Um, I think if I was to interpret the book for somebody else, I would say that the, the evidence that coercive interrogation led to bin Laden is very thin. And I had a long exchange with the script writer of Zero Dark Thirty on this issue, and I wrote 6,000 words about it for CNN.com after the, after the film came out, basically trying to lay out the case that the picture in the film that torture led to bin Laden just wasn't supported by the facts. Um, but, you know, I think, you know uh, the, the counter argument to what you've just said is that um, one of the big takeaways from the documents in the compound is how effective the CIA drone campaign had been on Al Qaeda, according to bin Laden himself. Um, so, you know, not, not all of these techniques, I mean, there's, a, there's two different questions efficacy and, 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 and e efficacy, efficacy and ethics. And something can be, eff, you know, um, something can be unethical while it's efficacious. Something can be ethical and unefficacious. Something can be unethical and unefficacious. Uh, so the list goes on. And I think you, I mean, hey, you'd have, we'd have to get into a more detailed discussion um, about each of these issues. Um, if Bin Laden was answering your question, he would have said, you know, Guantanamo was a great recruiting tool for me. The drones have been very bad. Uh, for my organization, so he would sort of have a, a mixed answer to your question. Maybe you would say that killing him would, would be the best thing that the U.S. could do, but also making him <laughs> Well, I mean, that, I want to go back to the question, uh, was this the best thing that the United States could do, was to making him shaheed or martyred? And I was struck by the total absence of reaction to bin Laden's death. I mean, in Pakistan, you can have a million-man march at the drop of a hat, and in fact, the number of protests after bin Laden's death were minuscule. So people didn't have that reaction. And I can't, you know, we often talk about how, you know, a particular drone strike is going to create a martyr or, I mean, if it didn't create a martyr out of bin Laden, you know, it's funny enough that the, the, the people that Al Qaeda takes seriously as martyrs are people who are religious leaders like Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Uh, but if you're a fighter who dies in the cause, you don't become a martyr. And then you don't, it's not, it doesn't become a great sort of cause. Um, I have two questions and I think they're both pretty straightforward. Um, you talked about the, the real 20th hijacker. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, are you able to talk a little bit about the background for why there's been sort of a generally held misperception about the identity of that 20th hijacker and, um, my second question is um, in terms of the, the compound that you were able to see, and you talk about you talked about it today, and you talked about it in your book that it was quite sparse and um, under the circumstances maybe you know surprising in some ways the, the the beds that you described and how uncomfortable they presumably would be. Um, is is your understanding of the reason for that, was it um, a strategic reason to remain you know, out of suspicion or was it limited resources or was it more a matter of principle? I remember you talked about in the book um, bin Laden not wanting um, his family or associates to get used to luxury so that they could you know, be prepared for life on the run. I think it was, you know, bin Laden, um, like uh, some children of very rich people, was also very careful with money um, and he, um, almost pathologically stingy. People would complain about how little he would be paying them, paying him. Um, and also money was tight. Um, and his personality was somebody he, uh, you know, he, he, he seemed to revel in 
living out like a sort of peasant. Um, you know, when, when they were living in Tora Bora, which was his idea of vacation, they were living in a sort of small hovel. Um, they were, they were, there was no electricity or heat. I mean, Tora Bora is really, I mean, it's like being in the foothills of the Rockies or something. It's very cold and uh, his, you know, his family would complain and he would take them on, you know, 12 mile hikes, which he seemed to just revel in. And so I think his personality was somebody who just didn't, he, w he really rejected the, <coughs> You know, in Kandahar and in Sudan, two of the hottest cities, places in the world, he didn't have air conditioning. He almost made a point of it. So I think it was his personality. Um, and on the first question about the confusion about the 20th hijacker, I think because Zacharias Moussaoui was very quickly identified, uh, it became a kind of media shorthand that he was a 20th hijacker. And of course, we now know that he was part of the second wave of planned attacks in the United States. And Mohammed al Qatani, who was the guy turned back in the summer of 2001, really was the 20th hijacker. And one of the reasons United Flight 93 didn't crash into the Capitol was because there were only four hijackers on the plane. I mean, the, the, as opposed to five, which was true on every other plane. Uh, and Mohammed, the idea is Qatani would have been a muscle hijacker on that plane. And luckily, it didn't happen. How, how do you feel about that? And, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel very strongly about it at all um, in the sense that people are. I don't think, I mean, you know, that's just the American way, I think. Um, and it's, it's, you know, Zero Dark Thirty, I think, the reason that I could write 6,000 words critiquing it as a work of history is they claim that it was a work of history. Um, that, you, you know, often if you look at a Hollywood film, it says, you know, uh, inspired by real events. But it didn't say, you know, based, you know, this is, they didn't make the claim that this was based on their own reporting and blah, 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 which was true, but you can't have it both ways. It's either a work of history or it's a work of entertainment, and they try to have it both ways. And when they were critiqued as a work of history, they said, well, it's a film, not a documentary. So I, I think it, it op they opened themselves to a legitimate question about how accurate was this. And the idea, by the way, that there was only one person in the CIA, this female played by Jessica Ch Chastain, who really wanted to find bin Laden, I mean, clearly, it doesn't pass any kind of common sense test. So, um, but, you know, as a film, I think it's very effective. As a piece of history, it's not as good. But I don't think anybody going there is going to think, wow, this is how it really happened. You'd be uh, surprised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Well, I think, this, the, I think the, the account of what happened, the U.S. Navy SEAL raid on the house is, I think, very effective. Uh, there is one detail that is completely wrong, which is you can see <laughs> what's going on because in the film, I mean, you can't have a film that's entirely filmed in, you know, at night. I mean, there was, this was a moonless night. There was no electricity in the neighborhood, so they had to kind of fudge that slightly. But I think it, it, it's, as an almost real-time account of what happened that night, it's very close to what happened. My second question is, uh, and this was touched on, for, you know, even though it was for a very short period of time, you met the man and you've spent a lot of time doing research about he reminded me a tiny bit of you. <laughs> if that was the question. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> In any event, my question is, uh, it, based on your instinct, based on your knowledge, was this guy a true believer, or was he someone who was out for power who made a colossal miscalculation? I think he was a true believer. And in fact... Um, you know, I, can't, I was born, I was raised a Catholic, and I think you cannot, uh, it, you cannot absent his religious views from who he was. This guy was a religious fanatic from the age of 12. He, um, even as a teenager, he was fasting twice a week. He was praying seven times a day. And to say that Islam had nothing to do with bin Laden is like saying the Crusades had nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, this is a guy who was a religious fanatic. Um, and uh, so he was a true believer. And uh, you know, his idea of fun when he was a teenager was to get a group of his friends to come around and start singing religious chants about retaking Palestine. So that, he's been like this from an early age. And I, don't, I think it's tempting to try and discount people. Uh, it, some people would like to discount religion or would uh, try and discount religious beliefs, but I think they're very powerful and they certainly animated him. Um, back to the beginning. 
You spoke of various excuses for not taking Tora Bora with forces. What's your take on why we didn't go in with the I troops think, on the ground? You know, we, we, you know, basically one of the more incompetent military commanders of American history, uh, which is Tommy Franks. Tommy Franks screwed up two wars. It's pretty impressive to screw up one. But, you know, he retired three weeks after the fall of Baghdad. Uh, leaving, you know, a, a mess that we now know, uh, you know, it, it could have been a lot better. So he just made bad military decisions. Um, I mean, it was extraordinary. Yeah, I, I think you have to rewind the tape a little bit. The last war the United States had been involved in before 9-11 was Kosovo, in which no American soldiers had died. And a narrative... And, and before that, of course, there was the Black Hawk Down incident. So a narrative developed in the Pentagon that the U.S. public has zero tolerance for casualties and we can't have casualties. And if you read Bob Woodward's book about the first, uh, the war against, the, his very first one about the Afghan war, uh, there was, you know, Rumsfeld was apoplectic that the CIA was in Afghanistan doing all this stuff before the, before the U.S. military. And you look at Rumsfeld's biography, you know, he's sending memos to, like, to his people saying, why can we, why can we not get people in? And so, uh, you know, the, the army was very risk averse um, and Tommy Franks was in charge and he just made the wrong decision. Um, I don't think it was that, that complicated. And, oh, by the way, one kind of important detail. On December 3rd, 2001, when the battle began, uh, Donald Rumsfeld tasked Tommy Franks with rewriting the Iraq war plan, which was 800 pages long. And he had, so basically gave him a week. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the guy was, we were, you know, anyway, suffice to say, mistakes were made. So, um, Mr. Bergen, thank you for being here. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, Zero Dog 30 does give the impression that women in the intelligence community were vital or played some role in apprehending bin Laden. Is this general impression true? Yes. And, um, you know, I, I, I treat it in the book uh, briefly. Um, and the film that was based on my book um, that was on HBO kind of took that and made it into a whole appropriate story, which was the account of the female analyst of the CIA who tracked bin Laden. And Mike Scheuer, uh, who was the head of the bin Laden unit, told me you know, he would have liked to have put up a, a note um, saying no men apply uh, <laughs> for his unit because he basically said, look, women are better analysts, they're smarter, they make connections, they're more patient, they don't tell war stories, they don't take cigarette breaks. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and as a result, uh, the unit was made, largely made up of women. And of course, one of the stories in Zero Dark Thirty and also in my book and, and, and the HBO film is the tragic story of Jessica Matthews, who was a mother of three in her mid-40s, who was killed by an Al-Qaeda suicide bomber at Hosts in December 2009 uh, by somebody she thought she'd recruited to find the leader, the number two in Al-Qaeda. And she was one of the original you know, people in the bin Laden unit. And there are others that I can name, Gina Bennett, who uh, um, uh, you know, played a critic, wrote the first, the, f the very first uh, memo that the U.S. government wrote about a guy called bin Laden saying this guy's going to be a threat was written by Gina Bennett in 1993. Uh, the, uh, another person is um, the person who wrote the August 6, 2001 presidential daily brief uh, that bin Laden determined to strike in the U.S. It was written by somebody called Barbara Sood who had a Ph.D. in medieval Arabic theology from Princeton in the 70s, which must have seemed like a pretty obscure thing at the time, but turned out to be very useful uh, in her subsequent career as an Al-Qaeda analyst. So the point is, is that women uh, analysts of the agency were uh, very involved, um, and the Zero Dark Thirty Jessica Chastain character does exist. Um, I didn't speak to her, but the screenwriter for the film spoke to her at length, and it very much represents her view of what happened. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely more than, I mean, it's no surprise. I mean, with the, the CIA has changed along with society. So, the, you know, uh, it's uh, an organization where uh, women have many leadership roles. Colby's not there anymore. Right. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, can I ask you, in terms of ethno-nationalist terrorism, sometimes we have a direct, we have a clear role that our clear aim that terrorists are, are aiming towards. 
In the case of bin Laden, it's a little bit less clear. Can I, can I get your views a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, global jihad as opposed to let's liberate Ireland or let's liberate, choose your country. So I think that it makes it much less legitimate. I mean, ethnocentric terrorism, let's liberate Ireland from the British or let's liberate um, choose your country from somebody else has a lot of legitimacy and, and also is much more tethered to uh, the public in a sense. I mean, they're, they're, one of the reasons bin Laden was, you know, an ethno terror, an ethno nationalist terrorist organization is going to be very careful about killing hundreds or thousands of civilians in a single attack for two reasons. They are concerned about public opinion in a way that Al-Qaeda is, is much less concerned. And they are concerned about, you know, a, 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 a huge crackdown in a way that Al-Qaeda was less concerned about. So I think they're, they're very different. And it's one of the reasons that bin Laden failed. I mean, if he, if, if he had said, look, let's, our goal is the liberation of Saudi Arabia from the Saudi royal family, that would have been a lot more doable and a lot more legitimate in many ways than we're just going to attack the United States and hope that they pull out of the Middle East as a result, uh, which was a pipe dream, uh, didn't succeed. Hi, thank you. Uh, three quick questions. The first is, uh, can you explain more about the, the uh, three quick questions. Uh, first, can you say about the, the, the second wave that you mentioned that, that would have happened? Uh, second, what was the role of uh, Zawahiri in the whole era? And it was number two. And third one following with that, is the U.S. planning to kill him as well? In reverse order, yeah. I mean, they're definitely planning to kill him. Um, I mean, they've tried to kill him already. They almost succeeded in killing him in a drone strike in January of 2006. They killed, I think, a cousin or son instead. So, um, yeah, I think that they would... I'm sure there are people working now and trying to find where he is. Um, you had another question about Zawahiri? Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, did Zawahiri lead to bin Laden? No. I mean, there's an incredibly bad book written by a former U.S. Navy SEAL uh, whose name I'm thankfully blanking on. But he makes, he makes the claim. He says that he talked to everybody on the raid. It, 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 basically, the whole thing's made up out of whole cloth. But his, the theory of his book is that Ayman al-Zawahiri tipped off the Americans to that they could kill bin Laden. Anyway, the whole thing doesn't make sense. But... Uh, Zawahiri um, didn't lead to bin Laden. And, um, and then in terms of the second wave, the second wave was a plan by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to have sent other people into the United States and do other attacks. Most of these attacks were very notional attacks. And that means Zakiris Massawi was given 6,000 bucks, told to do what he could. Um, obviously, it didn't work. Uh, so it was, a, it was a less sophisticated group that were recruited, Ayman, ha uh, Ayman Faris who was uh, planning to bring down the Brooklyn Bridge with a pair of, uh, with a, like a gas torch. By the way, um, if a obviously Pakistani person uh, was trying to, was, took out a gas torch on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, and appeared to be trying to bring it down after 9-11, <laughs> you know, which is one of the most heavily traveled places in the world, I think it would have attracted quite a lot of negative attention. Anyway, so... Um, so it wasn't a serious plan, and he abandoned it. I'm he said, look, there's too much surveillance on the bridge, and he, didn't, he was arrested. And uh, So the second wave of attacks were, didn't materialize because they, were, they, they, they weren't serious, and the people that they recruited weren't very sophisticated. You gave the example of <clears throat> the capture of Eichmann, yeah. um, talking about intelligence. But in that decision-making process of the leadership of the American, you know, the, 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 the people who were deciding whether to conduct this uh, operation or not, it uh, came out the idea of uh, trying to capture him alive in order to serve. The thing is that the Eichmann trial also served as a kind of collective psychoanalysis on the wounds yeah. of, and uh, uh, did anybody came up with that idea that uh, public trial of Osama bin Laden will help uh, heal wounds in American society regarding, you know, all that 9-11 and all what happened afterwards? 
or nobody just, you know, take him if he resists, shoot him? You know, uh, shooting somebody who's conspicuously surrendering is a war crime. So, um, and that is not peculiar to the U.S., you know, to the operation against bin Laden. So, if bin Laden had conspicuously surrendered, he would be alive today. And there was a plan to, to take him alive. There was a plan, they, they had, a, they planned for every eventuality. One of which was bin Laden being taken alive, perhaps wounded. He would have been taken to Bagram Air Force Base. There was a group of FBI, CIA, high value interrogators there, Arab linguists. They would have quickly talked to him there. Then they would have taken him to the USS Carl Vinson and they would have kept him on the ship for perhaps months. Don't forget this was a covert operation which they hoped would not become public. And they would have just interrogated him on the ship for a while. So there was certainly uh, a plan if it, to take him alive. Uh, I don't think people thought it was very realistic. And so going to your question about a trial, there were lots of people at the CIA who always wanted just to kill bin Laden. They thought a, a trial would be a soapbox for bin Laden. They were very concerned that if bin Laden was captured, that he his capture would be um, the impetus for Americans being kidnapped around the world in order to get him released from prison, which I think is a reasonable concern. So there were, you know, there were disagreements about in the, in the CIA and other places about what the best course of action was. But I think bin Laden made his own choice about what he wanted, uh, you know, because he could have surrendered. Uh, I, don't, I personally th never thought he would. I took him at face value, that uh, he was willing to die in this struggle. He didn't want to go to Guantanamo. He didn't want the humiliation of being taken by the Americans alive. On the other hand, he wasn't seeking martyrdom. One of the reasons, the reason that there was no the protests uh, around bin Laden's death were so muted, was uh, talk about an unheroic ending. Instead of the battlefields of Tora Bora surrounded by his men fighting off the Americans heroically, he dies in a suburban compound uh, surrounded by his three wives and dozen kids and grandkids and doesn't put up any resistance. It's not a heroic <laughs> ending, but it's the ending he chose. Yeah. You, you um you, you you seem convinced that it that it, it wasn't a war crime that, that but it, it the, everything you said would indicate that of the list of possibilities at the top the most desirable was to kill him so that other things being equal the 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 Navy SEALs going in probably intended to kill him. I mean, 15 yeah. minutes is a long time. The plane lands. It. I mean, the helicopter lands. It crashes. They come storming up the door. He's in the third floor. The door is open. He doesn't have a gun in his hand. I mean, it, it, you could say he didn't prostrate himself and surrender. Right. On the other hand, there was not. It would seem that the 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 the, the message or the intention of of the of the the the, the SEAL team was unless otherwise proven clearly to be unarmed and to be surrendering, they wanted him dead. Don't, you, you seem to be arguing against that. Well, you know, let's start with the fact that I'm not a lawyer, um, or certainly not an international human rights lawyer. Um, <laughs> and this was a pretty confusing event for all concerned. I mean, one of the reasons we have different narratives by different, different Navy SEALs have said different things about what happened that night. We know from car accidents that five people watching a car accident have five different stories about what happened. So this was uh, a moonless night, no electricity. The SEALs are wearing night vision goggles. There's a firefight, first a helicopter crash in the first uh, one minute. Then there's a firefight about five minutes later with one of his bodyguards in which he's killed. Then they kill bin Laden's son. They also kill another bodyguard. They kill a woman who's married to the, one of the bodyguards. They wound bin Laden's wife. Um, you know, a visit from the U.S. Navy SEALs is not a visit from the Red Cross, so undoubtedly. But, uh, you know, I think that if he had um, – I just think, you know, it is a fact that it is a war crime to shoot somebody who is conspicuously surrounding. He didn't do that. Um, and, you know, I, I, but, I, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, 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 th I don't think you send the SEALs on an operation with the expectation – uh, yeah. they are designed to kill people. I mean, that's what they're, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why you send the SEAL Team 6. Um, but not always. I mean, we saw just now in Somalia, 
uh, when they went in to try and capture, kill the guy that they were going after after the escape mall attack, that they retreated. Um, they also took that guy, Abu Libby, uh, alive in Libya, in, in Tripoli just now, which was a Delta Force operation. So I can't be certain because no one can be certain given what I just described. Um, bin Laden had repeatedly said, I'm willing to die in this, and I, has, I, I think that's true. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think you answered your own question. I, think. No, I mean, I think, I mean, that, you know, maybe, yeah. I, 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 he was rescued by the U.S. Navy SEALs. Mr. Bergen, I would like to ask you about the role of media. Um, how, would like to, how would you address the role of media from the beginning of 9-11 attacks and until the uh, hunting of Laden and those processes? Do you think the media sort of shortened the timing of bin Laden hunting? In kind of, is that an effect directly to the, con especially you know, in terms of counterterrorism perspective? You know, I mean, I work in the media, and it's just like everywhere else. There are some people do good work, some people do bad work, some people are sociopaths, some people are uh, lazy, some people. I mean, I think making generalizations about the media, um, there's been great reporting, um, there's been poor reporting, there's been very brave reporting. My friend Tim Hetherington was killed in Misrata, uh, documenting uh, the the war against Gaddafi. I've had friends who've been killed. Uh, in Iraq, um, you know, I've had friends who, um, you know, don't do their work, and yeah, you know, I, I just think sort of making generalizations about the media, uh, I think, is difficult to um, sustain. Clearly, there was a huge, uh, you know, the, in the run-up to the Iraq War, the media didn't really do a very good job um, of skeptically probing what the government of both the United States and many other countries were claiming. Unfortunately, Saddam, you know, kind of played into that by, Saddam was lying about his capacity to his own, 
his own generals. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, to be honest. Maybe you can clarify or... Yeah, but I think that's sort of like saying that does oxygen play an important process in life? Or, I mean, the media is sort of an imperfect reflection of reality. And, you know, I mean, is the question that the media made bin Laden into bin Laden? Or is that the question? The question is, would it be more than 10 years, like maybe not, uh, maybe seal team would have been captured him like 20 years later? Do you think that media shortened that process to capture uh, bin Laden? No. Let, let, yeah. Let me let me make the following observation. You know, if you take um, if you look at the uh, intelligence budget since 9/11, we spent half a trillion dollars, which is a very large sum of money. Um, and and I, I, this is really an observation about how it, it took. A, I don't think it took. Uh, it, it took way too long to find bin Laden, given the amount of resources we have. It should have been much quicker. Uh, so the, I, I wouldn't talk about the media in that context. I would talk about um, the failures of the intelligence community to get him earlier and, and the national secu security community writ, writ large, which isn't to say that there wasn't good work done and it was a very, you know, it was the process took a long time. A lot of good people were involved, but as I indicated earlier, he could have been stopped at the Battle of Tora Bora. I'm more or less curious about your opinion on um, Al Qaeda and Syria linking up. I'm working on a thesis about Syrian insurgency right now, and obviously a lot of my research has led to that. What do you, do you think that means in terms of the United States and counterterrorism policy, or basically what, if we're at risk for something as great as an attack as 9 11 has been? Yeah. Well, you know, Al-Qaeda in Syria seems to have learned from the mistakes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and for the moment they aren't imposing large-scale Taliban rule on the population, and they are sort of acting as a sort of kinder and gentler Al-Qaeda, and they're organizing tug-of-war contests and ice cream con eating contests and public meetings, and they seem to have learned from some of their mistakes, which is worrisome. And in fact, CNN had a very interesting piece last three or four days by Nick Peyton Walsh, where they they basically, they 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 took... They, they surveyed activists in lots of different Syrian cities to say, is Al-Qaeda, or the Al-Qaeda affiliates, which have you know, different names, are they you know, the biggest force in your town or city? And it turns out that much of northern Iraq is basically controlled by Al-Qaeda now. Um, and so that, that is worrisome. Now, it, this could play out in lots of different ways. Al-Qaeda in Iraq controlled a third of the country in 2006 because they controlled Anbar province. They lost it because they pissed off the local tribes who rose up against them, who were then aided by the U.S. military, and they were basically defeated. And any now in Syria, you know, will they make a sort of similar mistakes? Will some other outside force intervene? Would the United States intervene at a certain point? We don't know. But I think it is, you know, if Al Qaeda can stage a resurrection, it is in Syria, and they do seem to have learned from their mistakes. They're behaving more like Hezbollah, providing social services to the population. And I think that's, that's, that's all a cause for concern. However, embedded in their DNA, I think are, they tend to make the same set of mistakes, which is they tend to, they want to impose, they really want to impose Taliban-style rule on the population. They, um, and that tends to go down poorly. Look at what happened in Mali. In Mali, they imposed Taliban-style rule on the population in northern Mali, which is the size of France. No one, they couldn't, they just waited around until they were liberated by the French military, which until relatively recently controlled Mali. Uh, it's not often that a country that formerly occupied you is then greeted as an army of liberation, but that's what happened. So that's how it could play out. Uh, but another way it could play out is, you know, lots of foreign jihadis go to Syria and they get training and then they try and do attacks in the West. That was a concern during the Iraq war, but it didn't happen because we're much more cognizant of the problem than they would have been during the Afghan war. So. And that's a long way of saying I don't know what's going to happen. Um, Yogi Berra said it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future, so that's uh, how I feel. 
So, you know, the uh, uh, one of the most interesting points you made, I thought, was that that the that there were uh, f the, the absence of demonstrations when he died, and that and that in a way it symbolizes the end of the war on terror as it was formulated by by uh, uh, by Bush. But don't you think that and and you said, but just before we started the seminar, that the cr book you're currently working on now is uh, domestic terror, the American, and don't you think that the that the the, the, the way in which somebody like that can live on the internet gives a kind of an immortality to uh, and, and a potential inspiration uh, for uh, uh, terrorists every, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And if you look at Al um in like, you know, literally two dozen cases in the United States and, and other cases, he, he continues, he was influential on the Sane of Brothers. So even in death, he's sort of influential. Um, so yeah, I mean, these ideas uh, can linger on. It's an interesting question about how ideas die. Um, you know, Marxist-Leninism is still current probably in some pockets of maybe even this college. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, but, uh, no uh, but it's, uh, but you know, Marxist-Leninism died, largely died when, uh, yeah, when the Soviet Union expired, Marxist-Leninism sort of died along with it. I think it's going to be harder to kill Al-Qaedaism as an idea because it, it makes claims to do with God that are uh, less sort of disprovable by actual events. So the Soviet Union didn't work. It was a Marxist-Leninist state. That spoke for itself. Since Al-Qaeda claims to be, uh, you know, that sort of authorized by God, these ideas are quite difficult to die. Uh, but I think that they can become less and less relevant over time so that they become sort of nuisances rather than national security problems. And I think we're at the stage where it's sort of a nuisance, not to, uh, not to under, you know, uh, except in places like Syria, but even there, the prognosis for the reasons I've already outlined could be bad. And certainly, if you look at, our, if I was Osama bin Laden scoring this, you know, in Yemen, I lost. We control, they controlled a good chunk of the country. That's over. In Mali, they lost. Um, they've lost in Afghanistan. They've, to some degree, lost in Pakistan. They've completely lost in Southeast Asia. If we'd had this conversation in 2003, we'd be concerned about Jamaa Islamia and their capabilities throughout Southeast Asia. They're basically gone. So, um, you know, these groups, they don't have to be around forever. Yeah. <laughs>